Welcome to another Inside Number 9 review, where this week we'll be exploring the worlds of online speed dating and serial killers. Thankfully, we're allowed to have more than four minutes together on YouTube, so pour yourself a glass of whatever you're having, and let's talk about Love as a Stranger. This episode follows Vicky, who is looking for love on a speed dating website. But there's bound to be a catch, as we keep hearing reports of homicides happening in the area by someone the press has dubbed the Lonely Hearts Killer. Of course, this makes us instantly suspicious of everyone Vicky talks to, some of whom do give off slight serial killer vibes. They also have a tendency of slinging thinly veiled or not veiled at all insults at the already awkward and shy Vicky. I'm not sure if this is an accurate reflection of the world of online dating, but it sure makes dying alone look like a very promising option. Each date uses these four minutes of character interaction to the absolute fullest. Every conversation is like a mini-drama in itself, and by the time the clock runs out, we've pretty much learned everything we'd ever want to know about that character. And we see the impact this is having on Vicky, who remains hopeful in spite of it all, yet a lot of those comments really seem to get under her skin. And to be honest, who could blame her? First of all, I'd like to say this was an outstanding performance from Claire Rushbrook. I spent ages racking my brains trying to figure out where I'd seen her before, and then I realised she was the one who did Daisy's terrible job interview in space many years back. So if you found yourself staring blankly while the theme from the Magic Roundabout played in your heads, then that'll be why. And while it would have been easy to portray Vicky as this pathetic sad sack of a person, her performance was far more nuanced, giving us someone we could really empathise with rather than just feel pity for. And I must say, this was a very strong cast in general. Number 9 never misses the mark when it comes to casting, does it? Matthew Horn, aka Gavin, was absolutely brilliant, and it's almost a shame we didn't get to see more of him. I feel like we saw some new range to him as an actor. I know he's mostly known for comedy, but I'd really love to see him do more roles where he plays a potentially dangerous, unsettling weirdo. That is a very strange compliment to give to someone, I know, but it's great to see him play against type. Frances Barber's character was good as well, more about her in the spoiler section, And of course, Asim Chowdhury, I hope I'm saying that right, was just top-notch. Great character, great performance, just great all round. It's always fun to see Reese and Steve in minor roles, and Reese's slightly older, out-of-touch, crabby posh guy was definitely entertaining. I was reminded a bit of the Doctor from Series 3 of The League of Gentlemen. Now, out, would you? And did anyone else immediately spot the Pauline line when Vicky was asked about her age? Steve, likewise, does a great job with Manny, a cheeky chappy with a special interest you could only find in a number 9 character. We've had cryptic crosswords, copywriting magic tricks, and now we have a guy who helps people solve Rubik's Cubes. What a fantastically niche interest, said the person who's made over 30 videos in Inside Number 9. Now, some elements of this episode might have been lost on me, I'm afraid. I've never done online dating, I hate talking on webcams, and my sole reference to speed dating is that one episode of Peep Show where Mark ends up with the scary Australian lady. But this does feel like a realistic take on the subject, especially for middle-aged people getting back into the dating pool with all the online jargon, innuendo, and minefield of social faux pas. Seeing the daters desperately trying to find that click while also having their guards well and truly up was an interesting balancing act. And of course, we know that people often aren't their true selves online anyway, especially when trying to make a first impression or they're out for their own ends. We see stories changed, lies exposed, and you can't help but feel the heart and frustration, but the fact that Vicky never loses hope does help to keep us invested. Overall, very well done. So that's us approaching the realm of spoilers, so if you haven't seen Love as a Stranger, then I'm afraid that's our time up for now. By the way, if this video comes out and I'm saying this around the four minute mark, then I'll be really, really happy with myself. But otherwise, thanks for listening. I'll be back next week for another review, so hold on tight. Until then. Right, so now we come to spoilers, if that's even the word for it, because I saw a lot of people, myself included, clocking the twist from very early on. Now, I know it's not all about the twist, but this time it feels like, why even make it a twist reveal? It was a decent premise already, and the element of surprise didn't really add much, at least not for me. They could have just set her up as the killer from the beginning, and the suspense would come from which of the dates she was going to target as her next victim. I suppose it adds a little bit of spice to the first watch, while you're scanning each of the dates looking for red flags, but by the second watch, you know it's all just red herrings. There's probably a joke in there about red herrings and things being pickled in jars, but I'll leave that up to you. 
Thankfully, there's more going on in this story than just catching the killer, and the date scenes were what really carried the episode for me. But I don't know, I still feel like we'd lost some potential there. I saw a brilliant suggestion from someone, I can't remember if it was on Reddit or on Twitter, who said it would have been brilliant if Jay had been an undercover cop who set up a dating profile with the aim of catching the Lonely Hearts killer. I think that would have been amazing and still very much in keeping with the rest of the plot. Either way, it wasn't her lasagna he was after. Speaking of Jay, I think that the mouse face filter might have been a nod to an actual news story where a lawyer in America got stuck with a kitten filter on during a Zoom call and felt the need to announce, I'm not really a cat. Also, small thing, and I'm not sure if this was a deliberate choice or not, but I like that Jay's filter was a mouse, which is a prey animal, hinting that he's the one in danger from Vicky, especially as the story that might have inspired it used a cat filter, i.e. a predator. And speaking of animal symbols, did I spy the hair statue in Reese's background? I'll be really glad if I'm right, because I hardly ever spot the hair the first time around. As for Steve's session, it felt really warped and, sadly a bit realistic, that his wife would choose to have a go at the woman on the webcam, who had no idea what was going on, rather than her husband, who knew exactly what he was doing and has presumably cheated before. I don't know, I think Manny might be the problem here, but hey, I guess it's easier to blame a stranger for leading her husband astray than to confront the real issues within their marriage. As I said, it's not right, but it is believable. Of course, we didn't see what happened between that couple once the webcam was switched off, so maybe Jay wasn't the only date that ended in violence. Another part I really liked was the conversation with Leslie, which turned out to be a really sleazy and shameless pitch for a dieting product. Sorry, that's a wellness supplement, an opportunity, or the first step on your way to a brand new you. Ugh, don't even get me started. It reminded me of one of the numerous stories I've heard about multi-level marketing companies. You know, those pyramid schemes in all but name that rope broke and lonely women into selling snake oil and fugly leggings. I say heard about them because I never actually got one of those copy-paste sales pitches from an old high school friend. I never had any friends in high school, so jokes on you, fuckers. But seriously though, I've heard horrible stories about these companies using social media to target the most vulnerable people they can find. So when I clocked where this segment might be going, with Leslie using a dating site to target bubbly women, I thought, oh my god, don't give them any ideas. That section felt very real, in all the worst possible ways. As for the digs at pickup artistry, god, we really did plumb the sewers of the internet with this week's subjects, that was interesting too. Because while many of us have heard something about these courses, with most of their techniques running the gamut from ridiculous to repulsive, our minds usually go straight to the people who tout them, usually some smug-faced gimpoid in a suit telling tales of sexual conquest that are about as believable as Jay from the Inbetweeners. But what Number 9 chose to show us was exactly the kind of vulnerable and lonely men and boys that get taken in by these shysters and ripped off by their empty promises. And sometimes I can't help but feel sorry for these people. All those attempts at negging and demonstrating high value go about as well as you'd expect, which is to say, terribly. And there was no need to try so hard because, from what we could tell, Vicky already liked Jay for who he was, and the fact that he felt the need to resort to these techniques is just tragic, really. In the Den of Geek review, linked below, The author speculates that maybe if Jay hadn't tried it on, then maybe, just maybe, things might have worked out differently for him. It's hard to say really. Maybe he was doomed the second he walked into flat number 9, or maybe Vicky really was going to give him a chance before she swiped. I'm really not sure. So here's my main criticism of the episode. I didn't really get a strong motive from Vicky as a serial killer or much insight into how and why she's choosing her victims. And that kind of feels like wasted potential. If you're like me, and you're a bit obsessed with the old murder channels, you'll know that female serial killers are, in fact, very rare, especially those who work alone. I know we've had Women Who Kill at Inside Number 9 before, I mean, she's not even the first one in this series, but for most women who do this, it happens much closer to home. Usually they'll murder their spouse or a family member rather than actively seeking out victims, plus there's often a very clear goal involved, whether that's revenge, financial gain, or some kind of romantic rivalry. 
but here we have a female serial killer who's actively seeking victims, luring them in and collecting trophies. It sounds like she might even be getting good at it. That's fascinating, that's different, and I really want to know what drove her to this in the first place and how she's managed to get away with it so far. Not that I'm looking for tips or anything. Instead, there was just a brief mention of Vicky not wanting to be a victim and not wanting to end up like her mum. We do see her being treated poorly by strangers up until this point, and not just by men I might add, so maybe that's a motivating factor? We know that her dad and her brother both left and there's maybe some abandonment issues there, but it still feels like we're missing the most exciting part of this character's story. What made her start killing, and what is it that's driving her to keep doing so? Let me just stress, I'm not saying that the writing is bad. It's not. But this is inside number 9 we're talking about, so the bar is set pretty damn high. We had our last dose of Women Who Kill only two weeks ago with Anita Dobson, and that moment really did take me by surprise. In past series, we also had Maureen Sauerbots, a cold-blooded killer with a weirdly close relationship to her son, but admittedly we also had Psychoville to develop that character. And we also had Private View, where Fiona Shaw's character had a really unique and twisted motive for claiming her victims and harvesting their organs. Still an underrated episode in my opinion. Even Nadia in Thinking Out Loud, one of the episodes that definitely came to mind while watching this one, did have a strong personal motive for luring and killing her dad. So in light of those episodes, I'm afraid Vicky's story felt just a bit flat for me. Which is a shame because it could have been something really special. Another thing, and yes, I'm probably just nitpicking now, what was the point of the online speed dating system if no one was allowed to share private information and members couldn't choose to extend the session? Because I thought the point of speed dating was, if you clicked with someone, you'd be able to arrange a proper date with them afterwards, or at least stay in touch. But given how Jay is in such a rush to give Vicky his phone number, which he wasn't supposed to be doing in the first place, I have to ask, what's going on? Was the idea just to have an endless stream of four minute conversations with strangers and just leave it at that? Kind of like chat roulette without seeing nearly as many willies? I don't know, maybe I'm missing out on some detail here. I will say, I did like how on the loading page for the dating site it says data checked membership for your safety, which didn't quite turn out that way, did it? Maybe that's just a selling point for the website and isn't true at all, because if they were carefully vetting their clients, then surely they would have found a link back to the killer by now. And if they were doing this, but Vicky still managed to get around their system, it may have been nice to see how she was doing that. But yeah, I really am just nitpicking now, and I want to stress that this episode was still very creative, extremely well acted, and there's a whole lot to love about it. But maybe this is one of these stories that might have benefited from a longer runtime, and as I've said before, it's not always about the twist. Honestly, for this show to be so consistently strong eight series in is nothing short of remarkable, and it's still, in my mind, the best thing on TV. And I am so grateful that Steve and Reese are continuing to make this amazing programme. So those were my thoughts on Love as a Stranger. Have I missed something? Was I being too harsh? Or did you have a completely different take on this episode? I think we might have some interesting chats down in the comments, so please leave your thoughts and I look forward to reading them. Till then, mind who you talk to online and I'll see you again next week. Bye bye.